Welcome to Casual Friday. It's going to update you on some projects. I'm going to tell you about the retreat I went on. And then I want to talk about the Norwegian Pearl and whether or not it's possible to do that if you're an English knitter. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the knit along that I'm planning for later this month. And then I'm going to share a little bit about how I use spreadsheets to keep track of my project progress. So let's get started. I took a lot of things with me on the retreat that I could get started, that I could continue working on. And I'm really glad I did that because there were a couple of things where I either got tired of working on them or I realized this project isn't working and I need to do something else. So I continued working on my daughter's sweater, the second sweater. I um, finished the back and I still have to uh, complete the front. I, I finished the back and then I decided I want to get started on something else. So the something else I decided to get started on was a baby blanket for my, gr I guess he's going to be a grandnephew. We, we know it's going to be a boy. I bought the yarn a couple of weeks ago. I've I, my plan was to do a little bit of a different stitch pattern than I've used in the past couple of blankets that I've done that were similar to this. It's, uh, I use sequence knitting. I use uh, garter sequences. So I alternate between uh, knit garter and pearl garter. And if you alternate every two rows, you get this really interesting contrast. And I've done that a couple of times before. I put, I'll put some pictures of blankets up here so you can see. And I thought, well, I'm going to do something similar, but I'm going to do a little bit different sequence just to make it interesting for myself. And I ran into a problem. And that problem is that these yarns do not have enough contrast to do this two row repeat. It just, it just wasn't working. So I realized this is more, I, it, they're, they're not, this, they don't have the same color value. If, you, if I took a picture of them in black and white to see, are they actually the same color value? And they're not. It's just that normally I would use a very light color and a very dark color. And this time I used a sort of dark, a dark enough color, but probably the this, this lighter color was more medium than really light. It's not enough of a contrast. And so there's no, there's the pattern is obscured. And in addition, the particular sequence I chose doesn't produce a totally reversible looking um, fabric. So I, I had to think a little bit about what I was going to do instead. And I think um, I chose these colors. It's kind of a caramel color and uh, a dark red. And I chose these colors because the, my niece's theme for the nursery is Winnie the Pooh. And I thought, well, these are good Winnie the Pooh colors, but I, they're just not working in the way that I imagined. So I ripped it out and I came up with this morning, I got up at about four, 30 in the morning and I was thinking about what I was going to do and I think I have figured it out. So I'm going to get started on that sometime in the next few weeks and then I'll just have that as something to work in the background. But you know, sometimes it's funny how you can do something several times, think you understand completely how it's going to work and then it doesn't. It worked something, a wrench gets thrown into it. So the retreat I went on was really fun. I, I really loved it. Uh, I loved it just as much as I did the first time I went, but it was a very different experience. It's every, every time is different. I ended up rooming with the woman that I met my first retreat. They happened to put us together as roommates. So I was really delighted. She's working on the master hand knitting program and had, is also working on the technical editor certification that um, the Knitting Guild Association now has available. And I kind of heard about it. I'd seen in the past couple of months, somebody on the, in the designers group on Ravelry ask what the difference was between TKGA's course and another uh, course that they had seen offered that's offered by an individual person who is a technical editor. And what came out in that uh, thread was that TKGA's course is actually a certification course. It's not, they're not 
teaching you how to be a technical editor. They're testing you on your ability to do that. And you get feedback and you certainly learn a lot from doing that, but that's not the goal of this course. It's not to teach you to be a technical editor. It's to show that you understand what a technical editor um, does and that you can demonstrate that you have the skills. So it's, it's like the uh, master hand knitting program in that way. The master, you learn an awful lot with the master hand knitting program, but they're not teaching you how to knit. That's, they're saying you need to show mastery in this. If you don't know it already, you better, you know, go find out how to learn that. And then once you've learned how to do it, you can show us that you've mastered it. The other technical editing course is actually a course on how to be a technical editor. So I was looking through um, my roommate's um, materials just, just to see what the kind of stuff was that they were, they were asking for. And I found it really interesting. And one of the, the problems that I have with pattern writing is the detail work at the end. I'm just not a detail person. It drives me crazy. I'm not good at creating a process and then just sticking to it, which is what detail type of people do. I tend um, to get through projects um, by enthusiasm and just and jumping around a little bit. And so that those final details um, are not interesting to me. It's when, <laughs> when I'm not learning, it's when I'm just cleaning up. And so I was interested in this. I mean, one of the things that they say, a, tech, a good technical editor, like the number one thing is very good with the details. And then they list all these other things. And all of the other things are things I'm very good at. The detail thing is something that I'm not. So what I would like to do is kind of build, learn to build my, a process for myself so that when I write a pattern, just the process of writing a pattern, I don't have to make as many decisions as I normally make. Like, oh, well, I could do it this way or I could do it that way. How did I do it last time that I'll be able to create a style sheet for myself? I'll be able to have a process. I'll know uh, whether or not I'm going to hyphenate the word, the words cast on, you know, whatever, whatever the, the thing is that where you have choices in a pattern, then I'm going to be able to set up a style sheet for myself. I, I looked at what the materials were like and I um, decided to send off for them. So I'm hoping that this is really going to improve my ability to produce published patterns rather than just designing things, making them, being happy that my design came out and then never publishing the pattern. I want to try to break away from that. So we'll see how it goes. So one of the things that's great about this type of retreat is that since there's just a big room full of knitters sitting around, you are talking with the people around you, but you might overhear somebody else talking about a subject that's interesting to you. And, and so you might join in that conversation or somebody might just announce that they have a question and does anybody know the answer to it? Um, I had a really great time. At one point, I just went around person to person. I wanted to see what everybody was working on because you can't, you, you can kind of be aware of what people are working on right near you and, and during show and tell, if somebody wants to stand up and show what they're working on, you can find out. But otherwise, it, you know, so that was just really interesting to me to see all of the, the different things that people were working on and how uh, everybody's tastes are really different in terms of the types of projects that they wanna work on. There was a woman who's sitting a couple of people away from me she was her first retreat and she said, I love mohair, I love brioche, and I don't know what the third thing was, if it was like shawls or something like that. And she show, she was had this be absolutely gorgeous brioche, mohair, shawl or wrap or whatever it was on. And I remember thinking, I don't like any of those three things. And yet I am just completely impressed with the projects that she was doing. It's just so funny to me that there's like none of those things tick, tick the boxes for me at all. And I love that. I love that there's so much for, um, for knitters that, that everybody gets to choose what they like to do. And there is no right or wrong when it comes to what your choices are. So at the end, at the very end of the retreat, we probably, there was probably an hour left before we all had to vacate our cabins and vacate the lodge and, and be on our way back 
back home. But there was some time we were done with show and tell and we were just all sitting there knitting. And there was a woman who said, you know, I have a question maybe somebody here could answer. And her question was about the Norwegian pearl. She does not enjoy pearling and is looking for a way to, to pearl that she enjoys. And she wanted to know if it was true that the Norwegian pearl was easier or was better or was worth learning to do. And there were a couple of us in the group who have used the Norwegian pearl and I was one of them. And I said, well, the thing with the Norwegian pearl is that you need to be a continental knitter. It's not something that you can do uh, if you knit English. And then another woman piped up and said, no, 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 you can do it English. And, and I, I think I was a little forceful in my response <laughs> or a little abrupt or I don't know what I, I, you know, I've tried to replay in my head what exactly I said and how I said it, but I said, well, you can do it, but you have to move the yarn so many times that it's just not worth the effort. And she kind of, you know, like I give and, and I didn't pursue it. I felt kind of bad about that because she was pretty sure you could do it. And, and, but I was a little dismissive, I think. And I didn't get a chance to go over and, and ask her to show me what she meant because I was quite certain in my head that I knew exactly what you had to do as an English knitter to do a Norwegian pearl. And I had an opinion about why that was not worth it. So I was thinking about it in the three hour drive home. I was just really going over in my head about, well, maybe there, maybe there's something I've missed that I haven't seen before. Because I, I, I made a video on Norwegian pearling maybe nine years ago and it was probably when I was still a Norwegian, when I still use the Norwegian pearl. I don't use it anymore as a continental knitter, but I did for quite a while. And every once in a while I get a comment on that video a question where people want to know, can you do this if you're an English knitter? And I always say no, but I also know that I'm constantly learning and maybe I've missed something. And so I always get out the yarn and needles. And once again, I look and see if I can figure out a way to do it as an English knitter and I never have been able to figure it out. Well, someone had asked me in the past couple of weeks on my channel, either on that video or one of my Casual Friday videos, I'm not sure which, had asked again about this, can you, can you do this as an English knitter? And once again, I had said no, and I've got the yarn and needles out to confirm. And that's when I'm like, well, you could do it. I mean, you could, you could make it happen, but it, that was when I was like, this is just not worth it. And that was why I was kind of kind of dismissive to this other other woman, other knitter. And so I and I thought, geez, you know, if she thinks you can do it, maybe there's something I'm missing. And so I looked at it again and I realized that I was looking at the Norwegian pearl, like the value of the Norwegian pearl based on a quality that it has that I desperately needed when I was first learning to knit continental. And that was, not only did the yarn stay in the back, but I just, I didn't have to move the yarn at all. So I am very right-handed. And when I learned to knit continental, I relied on the fact that I could just keep my, keep the yarn tensioned over my index finger and I didn't have to do anything with it. It was not like when you're, when you're a thrower uh, or a flicker or whatever it is, if you're English style and you have to do something about moving the yarn, you have to move it in some way. Some people are able to move it very efficiently or flick it or do something. Some people throw it or wrap it around, whatever, but you have to move the yarn from its position to the right, to the left, so they can come around the needle and back to the right again. But with continental knitting, you can just pick the yarn. The yarn doesn't have to wrap around. Some people wrap it around, but you don't have to. And that was what I liked about the Norwegian Pearl was that I had no dexterity with my fingers and I didn't need to move my fingers. It was in the same position it was in when I was knitting a stitch. But I was focused on the fact that it was in back. 
And so I, when I was sat down again after the retreat and I thought about if I were an English knitter, why would I be asking for another way to purl? When I was an English knitter, I didn't have any trouble purling. So to me, there was be no advantage to, to doing all this extra maneuvering that you'd have, to, you'd have to do. So I looked at it in a different way and I realized there's probably are some English knitters who have trouble wrapping for the purl. Like it's not the same movement. Like they have trouble making the same movement. However they're holding the needles, whatever they're doing, there's something different about the way they hold the needles and the way I hold the needles when I knit English that makes wrapping that purl really difficult. And that's when I realized the issue isn't that you need to keep the yarn in the back. The issue is wrapping the stitch just like you were knitting. So to do an English version of the Norwegian purl, what you can do, you, you have to move the yarn to the front, but what you can do with the needles allows you to wrap the yarn in the same way that you would if it was a knit stitch. So I'm going to show you um, what I'm talking about. I'm going to get a very brief overview of the Norwegian purl. So if you understand the Norwegian purl, that part would be easy. If you've never seen the Norwegian purl, um, you might want to go look at that Norwegian purling video. So let's look at the standard Norwegian purl. The idea is that the yarn stays behind, that before you insert your needle, the working needle, into the stitch, that the working yarn has to be in front of it. So it, when you work continental um, knitting, this is, that's a yarn over putting the yarn like that, that's a yarn over. So you have the yarn in front of the needle before you work the first stitch. The yarn is in back, so you have to bring the working needle behind the left needle in order to grab the yarn. And you would grab it just the same way that you would for knitting, but then, and these are very exaggerated motions, then you bring it back to the front so that you can pull the yarn through. Because anytime, however you insert your needle, whether you're inserting it this way or this way or through the back, however you insert the working needle, after you grab the yarn, after you either wrap it or pick or whatever, you have to come out the same way. So if you insert your needle through this way, and then after you have the yarn, you have to go back out that way. And if the yarn is in back, that means you have to arrange to get your needle behind here so that you can get the yarn, bring it back to the front so that you can pull it back through. But the, the main things to understand is that the working yarn has to be in front of the working needle before you enter as if to purl. Then you have to grab the yarn and then you have to pull it back through. So if you want to do this, as an English style knitter, your yarn is positioned over here. There's no just slipping the working needle in front of it. So in order to do a yarn needle as an English knitter, you actually have to bring the yarn around to the front like this. So that was always, my, well, if you're already there, you might as well just purl it. You can't keep the yarn in the back the entire time and do a Norwegian type purl if you are an English knitter. So what you can do though, is you can do a yarn over. You can do a yarn over, so now you still have your hand in the back like you would if you were going to knit. You can enter a zip to purl, but rather than having your yarn in front, like uh, having your hand in front to, to grab the yarn, you can keep it where it would be if you were knitting. And now you're going to do what you would do with a continental style Norwegian purl, which is to reposition your working needle so that it's in the back. And now you get the yarn. Instead of picking the yarn as you would if you were a continental knitter, you would wrap the yarn as if you were knitting. So you've worked, you've brought the yarn around the needle and now you need to bring the needle back to the front in order to pull, to complete the purl stitch. So again, the yarn is already in front. We insert it as if to purl, but then we position the working needle behind 
the left needle. We wrap just like we're doing a regular net stitch. Then we can bring the needle back to the front and through the stitch. So if you have difficulty wrapping for a purl but not for a knit, you could do this uh, as an English knitter. Bring it to the back, come around, and then pull it through. Insert to purl, bring the needle behind, wrap just like a knit stitch, bring the needle back to the front, and then pull through. Now that I have a different perspective on the usefulness of this technique for English knitters, I'm wondering <laughs> If any of you who are English knitters and have trouble purling, is the tr you know what is what is the the trouble that you're having with purling? Is it keeping the yarn on the needle while you're finishing your purls? Like what is the problem? And would repositioning your working needle in order to wrap or flick or whatever it is you do when you um, get the yarn around the working needle? Is this English method of Norwegian purling at all appealing to you or at all useful? I'm just really curious. But mostly, uh, it just made me realize that how different all of us are as knitters, not only in our preferences for what we like to knit, but in how we handle the needles, how we handle the yarns, what our ch specific challenges are in knitting, that, and that we can make assumptions about what other people are saying um, about knitting when we're trying to help them <laughs> or give our opinions that just may not be valid at all. So it gave me something to think about. I'm going to try really hard <laughs> not to dismiss somebody that when I know I'm right, I, I'm going to try really hard to say, can you show me what you mean um, in the future? Because I really... I really felt bad about the <laughs> um, reaction that that woman had. At the moment, my plan is for the knit along to start at the end of October. That's my plan. I should know more a week from today um, as I finish my samples and I complete my list of what I need to include in the videos because I'm including options for different uh, cast on bind off combinations, uh, how to fix mistakes that are very particular to this particular project, how you can modify this project uh, to serve your own needs in terms of changing around some of the stitch patterns or making it wider or narrower and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I want, I want to include as much of that sort of information as I can in the knit along videos and I just need to make sure that I can get all of that um, done in addition to my other videos uh, this month. So I mentioned many times that when I start a new project I rechart everything and I also create a spreadsheet to keep track of my progress and I've had requests a few times every time I mention this somebody requests um, that I explain in a little bit more detail what my spreadsheets are like. So I use them in a variety of different ways and the way that I use them has evolved over time. So I'm going to show you, I think it's four different spreadsheets and that show kind of the, the variety of ways that I have used spreadsheets to keep track of my, my progress on a project that you might find useful in one way or another for your own projects. All right, so here is an example of a spreadsheet that I used when I was knitting um, a baby blanket. That baby blanket um, that I gave to the dog trainer who kept Herbie from being euthanized. So I was knitting it in a sequence that was a two rows of light green then two rows of dark green so each one of these ridges so what i do it was knit in three sections this is these are just the the tracking for section one but i show the number of stitches i cast on 
and I was doing Judy's Magic Cast On, so I was casting on 99 stitches, but I was really doing two sets of loops. Now it's 198 stitches. So I, what I do here, how many stitches are on the needle for how many rows, and so then that multiplies that out. This is the running total of total number of stitches I have so far. So after that initial cast on, then I was working uh, two rows of green and two rows of dark green. This first row, I only did one row because I had a light green as part of the cast on. So that was 99 stitches, there's my running total. So then I started the dark green ridges, or actual ridges that were two rows a piece. And then I would do a light green. And so I was, I was keeping track of how many ridges I'd done. Uh, looks like I was keeping track of my of the date when I uh, got that far through because I wanted to kind of keep myself on track. I was keeping track of when I ran out of a ball of yarn so that uh, or how much yarn I had left in a ball so that I could predict and I was taking measurements to make sure that my row gauge is what I thought it was and so I could predict whether or not I had enough yarn to complete the blanket and in fact as I was working this I realized I was not going to have enough yarn and I went back to the store and bought more while they still had the yarn in the same dye lots. So once I knew for sure how long this blanket was going to be I could um, see how this is in the section two but I was keeping this running total and I would know at some point at the bottom here uh, and here here I am uh, calculating the number of stitches for seaming the different sections together and then I was picking up I was doing an I-cord bind off so I was calculating all the stitches I was going to pick up and how many I was going to work and then I got this grand total number of stitches and once I knew what the total number of stitches was going to be then I could calculate um, how much of the total any particular point was in the blanket. So you can see originally I had some goals of where I wanted to hit. I didn't actually make those. I ended up putting the blanket to the side for a while and then picking it up um, in the finish at February. Or maybe that's, well here, that's what the, these are, finish at February. These are February goals and originally I'd been working on it in December and put it just to the side. So, um, so this is a pretty simple thing. There's no shaping involved in this. Another type of, of tracking that I would use would be at the same time instructions. So I had this sweater that had, it wasn't a really complex cable, just that it had something different going on in every right side row. And it had two cable crossings within the 16 rows, but they were not evenly distributed. There was, uh, in the 16 rows, there was one on row number five and another one on row number 11. So there were six rows between these two cable crossings, but there were like 10 rows between this one and then the next one. So, so that was a little trickier to keep track of. There was one row where I had to do a yarn over at the start and the end, and only on that one row. And these are um, denoting that the outline of the cable, I'm going out, 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 crossing out, but these I'm crossing in, in, in. So there was a lot going on in that. And then I had to deal with things like neck shaping and armhole shaping, which aren't always the same thing. So, so this is the kind of thing where I can say, okay, and the first of the neck shaping, I need to do an SSK at the start of the row, and I'm gonna do this in my cable. And then the next row, which is the wrong side row, and maybe I have to bind off five stitches for the armhole. So those at the same time instructions can be really helpful when you have um, to map everything out at once. This is a spreadsheet that I used when I was knitting a project from my hand spun. So I, I knew how much it weighed, and I kind of knew how much yardage I had. I was working a pattern that had um, four rows in each repeat. And I wasn't completely sure how many repeats I was going to be able to complete in this project. So I periodically weighed my uh, yarn to see how much was left, and then I would calculate how much was remaining, how many stitches I had knit so far, 
So I knew how many stitches per ounce. And then based on what I'd used so far, how many stitches I thought I would be able to knit. So you can see that that changed over time. That at the beginning, it looked like I was only gonna be able to knit 4,600 stitches, but then the, the numbers jumped up. And I'm not sure if, if my yarn was thicker at the beginning. I'm not sure exactly what was going on. Um, but after every repeat, I weighed my yarn to see to predict whether or not I'd be able to do another repeat or not. And I also needed to know to, to make sure I had enough of the bind off. So I kept adding and taking out repeats in here, which would change the total um, number percentage wise. Uh, but what I cared about in this instance was whether I was going to have enough yarn, how, how long my yarn was going to last. Here's an example of the sweater that I knit this summer. And then uh, I'm using the same spreadsheet again, but I have different row gauge. So some of the information has changed, but this is the sweater I knit the first time. And I, I went through the entire sweater and based on, on the row gauge that was in the pattern, I originally calculated how many repeats and at what row number I would be working things like the underarm bind offs and things like that. But as I worked and I saw that my row gauge was different over here, I recalculated certain things, including things like the sleeve. So my um, decrease rates for the sleeve was different than what was in the pattern um, because I knew that the row gauge was different and I would end up finishing all my decreases many, many inches prior to the, to the wrist if I um, didn't space them out more. So I went through here and I've got the entire sweater charted out um, and then I decided to do some short row shaping instead of the stair step binding so I calculated that as well. And because the front is very similar to the back, the only thing that was different was when the neck shaping began for the front. Um, so a lot of it was repetitive and I, and then I had a record from the, from doing, um, the back, I had a record of how many rows I actually ended up doing at each specific spot. So I could make sure that I worked that same number of rows on the front before I started doing shaping. And again, so this is, you know, how many stitches I have on the needle, how many rows I'm working that many um, with that many stitches and it multiplies out the stitches by the row. So in this case, it's one row. So 82 and 82 are the same. But over here, I have 76 stitches that I worked for six rows. So it was larger. And this is the running total. This is probably row numbers, I'm guessing, for certain places. Yeah, so I was keeping track of row numbers um, for the body as I went to make sure that when I was doing shaping, if I changed anything in the number of rows that I was doing, that I could I confirm the total number of rows I had in the front with the back. Uh, and in this case, I wanted to check the neck band, make sure that, so I put all the instructions for the neck band in here now, because I wanted to make sure it fit my daughter correctly before I started doing the sleeves. And, uh, and this is all of my information for how I was working my short rows um, for the sleeve cap. And then here's my decrease rate here. And that's the thing where I changed it compared to the original pattern. And that just kept going. So let's see what else do I have up here. So sometimes I set a goal, like if I think this is something I can do in three weeks, I look at the total number of stitches, I divide, here's the total number of stitches, I divide it by 21 days. So that's my daily goal. So I give myself, you know, three weeks to do that and what percentage of the sweater that is. And then I keep track of what I'm actually um, doing to see how, if I'm staying on top of things or not. Um, I, I, you know, and then I, I wandered away at some point in here. I went a week without working on it all and then I went ahead and finished it up. So sometimes I, I do some goal setting in addition to tracking everything here. Well, that's it for this week. If you like my videos and like to support me, you can buy me a coffee on Ko-fi. If you have any questions or comments about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.